without further ado then, let us welcome Dr. Albert Hernandez. Thank you, thank you. Welcome back and uh, thank you for coming out on such a cold night. We're lucky it, 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 it hasn't snowed yet. So, as I said last week, um, tonight's topic is chivalry and knights and knighthood, okay? So let's say chivalry and knighthood, um, which is one of the aspects of the real Middle Ages that are very popular in medievalism. And you will remember what I said, medievalism is the use of symbols, tropes, stories, images, etc., 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 from the Middle Ages used in popular contemporary culture, okay? And Romantic medievalism was the beginnings of that movement way back in the 1830s, which gave us all kinds of uh, silly things and not so silly things as you will find out today. Um, I'm not sure it's a good thing to be doing this with the Middle Ages, okay? Um, I mean, sure, there's entertainment and there's fun and so forth, but there are some things about the Middle Ages and the misuse and abuse of the Middle Ages that can be very, very disturbing, as I think, I think we'll have a chance to get to some of that today. So here are my two little toy soldiers again. Um, you know, what, a, what an interesting image, right? Uh, there is the book learning about the Middle Ages, and then there's the playfulness about the Middle Ages which, as I just said, is not always that playful. So here is one of the quotes from the Bible that is most often used um, in various forms of medievalism. This is from Ephesians. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Who's the evil one? Satan. Satan. The problem is Satan didn't care about armor and medievalism. He couldn't care less. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay. Elsewhere, we hear about the Holy Spirit being the armor of God. And we can, put on the, 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 we can take on the Holy Spirit as if we were putting on the armor of God. All of which is kind of disturbing because Jesus never talked this way. And yet, these are the kinds of quotes that end up getting repeated and repeated and repeated in the Middle Ages during a very dark time when medieval feudalism and the medieval political system and that entire soap opera that I sort of made fun of on, on, on our first class session was on the verge of taking control of the church by capturing the papacy, okay? Uh, people always say to me, oh, how inappropriate of the medieval church to create their own, their own army, their own military. And I say to them, yeah, that's really beautiful and romantic and noble of you to say such a thing, but if I had lived back then and I really loved the church and cared about the church, I probably would have voted for the creation of those military orders. Okay, I'm also not a pacifist, I need to declare that to you. But you see, the Holy Roman Empire, and eventually the French monarchy, and anyone in the medieval world who wanted to, well, in the medieval European world, who wanted to create a, um, a glorious um, political organization, a glorious empire, a glorious nation, at some point, tried to control the church. And if they couldn't control the church, they would try to figure out a way for relatives of theirs to make it through the ranks of the church, from priest to bishop to archbishop to cardinal, and the ultimate prize to pope. If you look at a list of the medieval popes, there is almost always an anti-pope at the same time that there is the real pope. At one point, it got so out of control that there were four popes all excommunicating each other at the same time. <laughs> and that probably led to a diminishment in the public uh, and, 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 and upper class respect for the office of the papacy, okay? 
So, um, in the 1100s, some visionaries, some writers, some clergy began arguing that the church needed to be protected from the Holy Roman Empire and from the increasing power of the French monarchy in Paris. Remember, the world doesn't exist yet as you and I know it. There are no countries as you and I know them. Even though I'm saying French monarchy, that's a bit of a farce. I'm only saying French monarchy because of their language. There is no France. It doesn't exist. There is no Germany. It doesn't exist. There's no Austria. There's no Italy. There's no Spain yet. There isn't even an England yet to speak of. Do, 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 do you see what I'm getting at? Feudalism is the political system of the day, and manorialism is the economic system of the day. And some of the first orders that emerge are, for example, the Knights Templar, the Knights of Malta, the Knights Hospitallers, the Knights of St. John, the Knights of Jerusalem, the Knights of the Holy Spirit. Believe it or not, there was actually an order referred to as Cavalieri degli Spiritu Santi in Italy in the 1200s and 1300s. Things that Jesus would never have, you know, think about it, WWJD. What would Jesus do? He'd be like, yeah, uh, sorry, bye. He wouldn't want military orders upholding the word of God or the name of God. But again, if we judge this through our own lenses, we may be very unfair to the past. We can't blame the militarism of Christianity on these orders of warrior monks because the hospitalers are famous for founding some of the very first hospitals in the European world. In fact, hospitaler, hospitality, you know, where, where are there no hospitals today in the United States? Even in rural America, it is rare to find communities within, with, that are not within reasonable driving distance of a hospital. Uh, the first hospitals are actually founded by the Muslims in the Dar al-Islam, in ancient Baghdad and Damascus, far, far more sophisticated than anyone, anything that would exist in Europe for about another 800 or 900 years. It's not until the 1800s that Americans and Canadians even start catching up to what the Muslims had accomplished in the, in the 900s, the 1000s, the 1100s, and the 1200s, okay? In fact, the father of modern medicine uh, pays homage to these medieval Islamic and Arabic and Persian hospitals in his book, in his classic textbook written in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, about, the, uh, about, about why modern medicine needed to be revolutionized uh, like never before, okay? And he ends up being one of the founders of John Hopkins Medical Center, which is one of the top medical centers in the United States. So from a military order that had traveled on crusade in the East and had learned a lot about Islamic medicine, Arabic medicine, Persian medicine, those three things are not all identical. You could be a Muslim and not be Persian or Arabic. You could be Persian and not be Muslim or Arabic. You get the picture? We just collapse everything in our, in our Western Euro-American way of oversimplifying history. It's unfortunate, but, you know, um, sometimes it's an easy way to pack information into like an encyclopedia article, but it doesn't give us an idea of what was really happening on the ground uh, or the, the rich diversity that, that actually existed on the ground at any particular time in history. So back to what I was saying. So France doesn't exist. But there is a group of noble families in the region of Paris and northern France who have a vision of what they want for their fiefdoms, for their territories, for their lands, and for their influence across Europe and across the Mediterranean and stretching all the way east to the very, very powerful economic and learning centers of the Muslim East. Remember, Europe is a backward world, okay? Everyone wants to catch up to Arabian and Persian and Islamic culture and civilization, and even military might. Castles are invented in Syria, not in Europe. Think about that. 
See how medievalism leads us astray and that romantic medievalism? Castles are not places where people lived. They are military technologies. You might say a good castle is a good killing machine. Yep. Doesn't that sound diabolical? <laughs> a very violent world was the Middle Ages. A very violent world. On all sides, by the way. On the Islamic, the Arabic, the Persian, the European, you name it. The Byzantine. Um, and so there is this idea that gradually emerges that the church needs to be protected. And for the French monarchy and the French nobility, they have designs on power, power beyond Paris, power beyond northern France. And they're not going to become the first nation state. Spain is going to become the first nation state. But notice that a few minutes ago I was talking about the 1100s, and yet Spain and France will become modern nation states in the 1400s. So we're talking about stuff that takes several hundred years to develop, several hundred years to unfold. The similar patterns, similar processes are going on in England, since I assume many of you are of English or Scottish or Welsh or Irish ancestry. Okay? But England is nothing until the 1500s. The real struggle for power is on the continent, and it pits the Holy Roman Empire against the French monarchy and the French nobility. And the Holy Roman Empire is huge. It includes Austria, Italy, almost all of Central Europe, okay? parts of France. Um, and it's, remember what I said jokingly on weeks one and week two. It's neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. But it can field an army of 40 to 50,000 men at a moment's notice. And that's a sizable military force in the Middle Ages. Okay? And then there's also the, delay, the, the dilemma, the debate going all the way back to the year 800. That because the Pope crowned Charlemagne, the king of the Franks, remember him? Charlemagne just means Charles the Magnificent. Okay? His real name was Charles Carolus and a few other names. So the family's name is Carolus, and that's why we call that moment the Carolinian Revival or the Carolinian Renaissance. Um, and on, on a particular moment in the year 800, the Pope crowned Charlemagne the Holy Roman Emperor and forged a bond between the Holy Roman Empire and, um, and the papacy. And for, for centuries, the Holy, Roman, the Holy Roman Empire claimed, oh no, we, we have the right to oversee the papacy. We have the right to even say yes or no on who gets appointed pope. And so there's an incredible struggle that emerges between the church for autonomy, for independence, and the Holy Roman Empire, but also the entire feudal system. Because a lot of local lords and barons and, 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 and dukes and kings and princes then say, hey, why don't we get in on that game? Why don't we try to get one of our nephews or sons into the papacy? Sure. And I mean, really, it is incredible, but incredible. And it all culminates in an absolutely horrible way. In the early 1300s, when the French king, Philip the Fair, about whom there was nothing fair, um, basically takes the Pope hostage while the Pope was visiting him. And a few weeks later, a few months later, the Pope is sick. And we are pretty sure that the, that pope was beaten to death by one of Philip's marshals. And of course, what was the solution? Oh, but here's my cousin, my cousin the cardinal. He's ready, to, he's ready to stand in. Okay. And what happens to the papacy not long after that? It's abducted to Avignon. Now, I know that's not the way the French would want to portray it. We didn't abduct the papacy. Uh, yes, you did for 78 years, you see? And then imagine the, the nobility in Rome that saw the Pope as their leader and their sovereign. <laughs> what, a, what, what a paradox for them. What do they do? Do they go to war against Paris? Do they go to war against Paris and ask the Holy Roman Empire, hey, you want to join in? 
knowing all too well that the Holy Roman Empire will say, sure, we'll join in as long as you give us control of the lands around Rome. This is, you know, better, bigger is sometimes better. Smaller is not always better. The feudal system, th that system of political units that were smaller, um, wreaked havoc in Europe. Interesting that we get the word feudalism from the political system, to feud, to, to wage war, to have conflict. So I think you get the picture why the papacy felt that they needed orders, not just one, but multiple orders of warrior monks to protect the papacy against the state. Notice I just made a little transition there. I'm not just talking anymore about the French nobility or the Spanish nobility or the Holy Roman Empire. Eventually it was to protect the church against the state, period, all states. Okay? And, and, and it wasn't easy to pull off even then because of the feudal system of kinship ties. You know, what's the worst thing you can do in the feudal system? What's the greatest sin? Is it stealing? No. Is it killing? No. What's the greatest sin? Betray your family. Betray your, family. Betray your kin. It's the worst sin. In fact, in the, in the inferno, the lowest region of hell, according to Dante, is the place for the traitors. <laughs> and it's worse to betray your family than to betray your, your country. But betraying your country is not, is, is, is not far behind betraying your family. Think about this, okay? Um, and so if family allegiances mattered more than law, more than political, I mean secular law or ecclesiastical law, church law, <laughs> what a mess, what a mess. And it would take Europe hundreds of years to come to the rule of law thanks to all the revolutions of the 1600s and the 1700s. And look, we're still struggling to maintain the rule of law in modern day governments. So maybe the civic, the secular domain and the civic domain are more fragile than we think. But if you are Christians yourselves, United Methodists, all of you, I hope, um, I mean, really, how would you feel if the state were constantly attacking and, and, and trying to diminish this church or the United Methodist Church or if you're Roman Catholic, the Catholic Church. It's a, it's a form of war. It really is. Yes? Uh, it's okay. I won't go there. <laughs> but I understand what you're saying and... I am, I am the father of four children raised in the United Methodist Church who right now are not sure they want to set foot in one because of what you are alluding to. So uh, yeah, let me not go down that path. Yes, sir. So France and Spain became nation states about the same time. About the same time. Yes. Yes. Yes, and what changes everything is the events of 1492, when Spain uh, becomes the ultimate superpower of the late medieval world because of the incredible wealth that it gained from its colonies and because of the incredible sophistication of the Spanish Navy and of Spanish military engineering. And France is still a formidable force to be reckoned with, but it will take France about 200 years to overtake Spain. Uh, and it will take the English uh, about a hundred years to overtake Spain. But eventually it's Spain and England that are the superpowers of the early modern world. And France would continue to be a superpower until the end of World War I. It's World War I that brings fr French power down. But don't tell that to the French today. Uh, it's, France is still an incredibly powerful nation, as evidenced by their growing number of nuclear submarines, <laughs> which have been in the news lately. Um, no, really, uh, I mean, France is uh, a formidable foe to, 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 to have to deal with. 
But yeah, so th those nation states become nation states because of the ways in which the monarchies centralize power, the ways in which they try to offer the feudal warlords and barons concessions if they will stop feuding and if they will respect either Madrid in the Spanish case or Paris in the French case as the centers of power. Um, yeah. And eventually, you know, eventually, well, feudalism will die. It will die. It will eventually die. Colonialism is hyper-feudalism, in my opinion. Okay? This idea of giving warlords and conquistadors and adelantados, as they called them, or entrepreneurs, uh, land in Georgia, land in Maryland, land in Brazil, land in Mexico, do whatever you want with the locals as long as you pay your tribute and your taxes back to the crown. That is feudalism, except it's feudalism on steroids, as I, as I, did, as I say, because of the devastation that is unleashed upon the colony, upon the natural environment, upon the indigenous people who were already there, and eventually, as you know, on the colonists themselves, who have been born and who had been born and raised in the colony and didn't feel the same allegiance as their parents and grandparents back to the motherland. You know, back to England or back to France or back to Spain. Um, and, and it's incredible that the motherland then starts discriminating against its own great, 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 great grandchildren and the colonists. You know the story. It's the story of American history. It's the story of the revolution against, against Spain across all of its colonies. It's the, and and, we, and it's, it's the story of, 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 of the revolutions of the, of the 1700s and the 1800s, and really even up until the early 1900s, some of these colonies were still revolting against, against the, the fatherland or the motherland. Um, so the Templars are the medieval military order that is most alive and well today in medievalism, okay? Um, I don't think that the real Templars would be very happy with some of what's going on, okay? When you consider that, the French monarchy rounded them up. You know the story? Yeah. Friday the 13th of the year 1307. The French monarchy, fearing that the Templar knights had become too powerful, too financially powerful, too military too powerful in terms of military might that one day they might turn on the crown, might turn on the monarchy, called them home from, from, from across the Mediterranean, from all the way out to the Middle East, and began accusing them of blasphemy, of sodomy, of treason, of infidelity, etc., 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 etc. And Jacques de Molay, the last grand master of the Templar order, is burned at the stake uh, by Philip the Fair, Philip the Fourth of France, uh, and his grand marshal, and the fake puppet pope that they had. Um, and along with them, about a hundred and, the estimates are that about a hundred and, a hundred to 130 other Templars were executed. I, I don't believe the, the, the accounts that there were thousands, okay? Uh, a lot of them were just not important enough politically or militarily to, you know, to make more enemies. Uh, but what Philip wanted was the treasury of the Templars. That's what he really wanted. Because the Templars had become the first international bankers of the medieval world. And they did that before the Medici in Italy, before many of the great banking families of Italy uh, got their start. The Templars were um, international bankers, okay? You could actually pay a Templar uh, representative in one of the port cities of, of the Mediterranean European world and uh, make a deposit and then be reimbursed at your destination on the other side of the Mediterranean, um, and you wouldn't avoid, you could avoid the risk of the ship sinking and your wealth ending up at the bottom of the Mediterranean. That's just one example 
of some of the ways in which the Templars could uh, take in a check. Check is a French word, okay? Exchequer, a bill of exchequer. Uh, and then you could cash it in, or we might say trade it in on the other side. And there, this is just one example. There are many other examples of this, okay? Um, the Templars were the elite fighting force of the medieval world as well. I would say almost as elite as the Normans. The Normans are one of the great royal houses, royal families of the medieval world. At one time, they controlled the thrones of southern Italy, of France, and of England, okay, with significant ties to also to the Holy Roman Empire and significant ties back to Spain. Okay, Norman simply means from Normandy, the Northmen, usually from the county of Anjou in the north of France. So when you hear the word or read the word Angevin, Angevin, you are also looking at the Normans. The Normans controlled Sicily for 250 years, and they learned a lot from the Muslims, a lot, about military technology, about science, about books, about learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> okay, so there's the Normans as a military powerhouse and, and, and feudal powerhouse. There's the House of Anjou, and there's the Templars who are an order of warrior monks. They take vows of celibacy, vows of obedience, and vows of poverty. Okay? So I think you get the picture. The Templars are really big nowadays. Really, really big. Unfortunately, uh, uh, among the wrong group of people. White supremacists and neo-Nazis. So let me just move this along, because as you know, I could talk forever. And, and, and i got to tell you, I, I just love having an audience, real people in a real room. <laughs> oh, it's so nice to get out. Here is an example of medievalism from a very popular movie that came out in 2005. This is The Knight's Oath. Be without fear in the face of your enemies. Be brave and upright that God may love thee. Speak the truth always, even if it leads to your death. Safeguard the helpless and do no wrong. This is your oath. Kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. Yes, God wills it. <laughs> now, now, supposedly, while you're reciting this, uh, on the day of your, of your christening as a knight, um, I mean, you really did need to see it as if you were being baptized again, but you were being baptized into, into the profession of arms. And oftentimes, also, the person knighting you, a lord, a king, a prince, a duke, a baron, could even be a pope if you were a templar or a hospitaller, um, they uh, touched um, the sword three times upon you, uh, on the right shoulder, the left shoulder, and the forehead. And oftentimes, the prayer or the incantation was, in the name of God, St. Michael and St. George, I give you the power and the right to bear arms. Rise, sir. Okay, and, and again, depending on where in Europe you lived, because remember, there's no such thing as a, as a unified medieval culture. Depending on where in Europe you lived, the words and the ceremony might be a little bit different. Notice, though, that St. Michael and St. George were mentioned, which we talked about last week, right, when we talked about the dragons. St. Michael, meaning the Archangel Michael, who is the protector of heaven, the general of all the angels, okay, who will, who, will, who, who will do battle against Satan at the end of time, and St. George, one of the dragon slayers, one of the great heroes of medieval mythology and medieval iconography. Okay? So, the moniker that you see in the background is the moniker of the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. Notice the overt Christian symbolism, okay? This is not a Templar image. This is, uh, again, the Knights of Jerusalem, the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. And Kingdom of Heaven does a fantastic job of portraying that story. This was a movie that came out in the wake of 9-11. It's very much influenced by 9-11. Um, I've used it in class. I, I frequently cover it in ILIF courses. Um, it is, it is one of the few movies praised by the Arab American National Foundation and by American Muslim groups 
and Muslim groups in the U.S. in general uh, as portraying the Islamic and Arabic side of the Crusades in a fair and accurate light. My only concern is the way the Templars are portrayed. It's a little, eh, you know, I mean, in the same way there's bad Christians everywhere, there's bad Templars everywhere. Uh, we can pass this around. Feel free to thumb through it and take a look at it. Um, who knows? Some of the characters from that, from that movie and that story might make an appearance tonight on the screen. <laughs> let's see, let's see what kind of surprises we have. I think I showed you this one earlier, uh, on, on, uh, maybe on our opening night. The, the Red Cross is, is the quintessential emblem of the Knights Templar. And does anyone know why they call them the Knights Templar? Because they guarded the temple in Jerusalem. Okay? The temple in Jerusalem as a sacred holy site, sacred to all three religions. Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And they also were sworn to protect pilgrims en route to the Holy Land. Protect them from bandits, usually, because the roads were very unsafe to travel. Pilgrimage was really, really big in the medieval world. Pilgrimage is one of the ways that the medieval world comes out of its economic slumber. If you've ever been on a pilgrimage, you are practicing a medieval tradition. Whether your pilgrimage is to some holy site in New Mexico, or your pilgrimage is to the sacred sites of the Wesleyan story, of the Methodist story. Or perhaps your pilgrimage is to Santiago de Compostela in the north of Spain, one of the great pilgrimage destinations of the, middle, of the, of the, of the entire medieval world. And of course, Jerusalem was a very big destination as well. But not everyone got to go to Jerusalem and not everyone who went to Jerusalem either survived or ever came back because that was a huge undertaking to travel, let's say, from England all the way to Jerusalem at that time in that world. Um, there are stories of uh, Arab knights and Christian Templar knights achieving tremendous levels of respect between each other because of the ways in which they fought with honor and nobly because of the ways in which they did not turn their, their military skills on civilians or, or on crops, for example, or the ways in which they respected orphans and widows and so forth. But make no mistake about it, medieval warfare is a vicious, was a vicious kind of warfare. You are basically a hunk of meat in that context, um, and you die later, usually, uh, of your injuries. Um, who knows? Some have said that maybe there was more respect for human life in that hand-to-hand, -hand, face to face combat, uh, rather than when you take life from a distance uh, through automated technology. Yes? Who supported them financially? Excellent question. An entire, let me try, not, I'm going to use a, a modern word, an entire industry of supporters. Um, Usually they had a squire and a page. Uh, of a, a, a knight usually needed anywhere from three to seven people to support him, his armor, and his horse, and his equipment, and his tent. Um, so the knights are some of the wealthiest people in Europe. The knights who become Templars are supported by the wealth of the church. The knights who fight for lords and kings and dukes and barons and you name it, um, they are supported by the feudal aristocracy. And many of them are themselves from the upper echelons of the feudal aristocracy. Um, to be able to field a knight in full battle armor on a medieval battle horse was a major financial undertaking. Uh, at first, when the crusades started, the medieval horses, uh, the European medieval horses that had been bred were so large that they could not handle the heat and the climate in, in, in North Africa and, and in the Middle East. And so they, they, they needed to breed smaller, lighter horses. But the, reasons, the reason that the horses had evolved to be so large in Europe is because of the, the weight that they needed to support. Again, a knight in full battle armor. Um, and, and then also in the case of, of charging or jousting, um, the horse absorbed part of the shock when that knight got hit by the oncoming lance. 
Um, and so if the horse's backside was not strong enough, it could suffer some damage. But uh, yeah, there was, uh, it, it took anywhere from three to seven people to support one night. So we're looking at a major financial enterprise. However, as several modern day historians have said, a medieval knight in full battle armor charging across the field would be like a modern day tank rolling across the battlefield. It was that, I mean, you know, it was that, um, that overwhelming to whatever was on the other side. So there was knights and then a different group was knights templar? The knights templar are an order of warrior monks Yes, so yes. So it, if, if, if I was the lord of, let's say, Littleton, I might, I might not be as rich as the lord of Denver. And maybe as the lord of Littleton, I only had 100 knights under my service. But the lord of Denver might have 250. All of us, however, if our king called upon us, we would have to defend the king. And I don't know where you want to place our king. You know, you want to put him in Utah? You want to put him in Texas? Maybe not for Coloradoans. <laughs> you see how, how this plays yeah, out. So the Templars were um, financed by the church. By the church. And they fought for the church to defend the church and to protect the people of God. Now, did, they, did they ever all get together like the Knights Templar and the other Knights? Ever Sometimes. In the knights? defense of Jerusalem, yes. Uh, if a rogue king or a rogue lord was declared a heretic or declared uh, excommunicated, um, they could conceivably uh, join forces in order to restore order uh, or to bring that person down. Um, but for the most part, it was really the protection of Jerusalem and of Cairo and Alexandria that they came together. And in Kingdom of Heaven, the Hospitallers and the Knights Templar and then the Knights of Jerusalem fight alongside each other with all sorts of other mercenaries from these uh, nobility, from these feudal kingdoms back in Europe, okay? It's really complicated. Uh, uh, again, your question reminds me that standing organized professional armies did not yet exist, okay? Maybe the Templars are the closest thing to an organized standing professional army, the closest thing. Um, and then imagine if you're just, you know, average Joe farmer, upper class farmer um, in, again, the fiefdom of Littleton. Maybe you don't even train too many days a year as a knight. Maybe your armor is rusty and your battle horse has been used uh, to plow the fields and not for jousting practice. You probably wouldn't do very well when you get called into service if you're not practicing and training. Uh, in England later on, when the longbow makes its appearance on the stage of world history, the English laws, secular laws, said that all longbow archers needed to practice a certain number of days each month so that if the king or the lord needed them to protect England, they, they, they would be effective. And, and you know, last Monday, uh, yeah, last Monday, Monday, October 25th, we celebrated the anniversary of the Battle of Agincourt. Uh, the Battle of Agincourt was one of the most decisive battles in world history in which the English longbow, some would say, uh, 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 it was the Welsh longbow. Um, so if you're Welsh, that's true, by the way, it was the Welsh longbow. Um, it could travel 1,200 yards easily. And if you had 600 archers, as we believe King Henry had at Agincourt, they would be like a modern day machine gun, just spraying the field of battle with iron tipped uh, arrows. Uh, the longbow was the decisive weapon at the Battle of Agincourt. The English lost a few hundred men. The French lost over 10,000 knights. An entire generation of French nobility was wiped out, okay? And that was one of the decisive battles in the Hundred Years' War, which really did last for 100 years, between England and France as both countries tried to take over each other to expand their fiefdoms. Did anyone win that war? No, right? 
right? Because you know the rest of the story. England ends up becoming independent. France ends up becoming an, an independent nation later in the 1400s. See, I mean, it sounds like I'm talking about a soap opera. I hope I'm not overwhelming you with too much information. I, I don't know how to teach any differently. Um, I could slow it down a bit. L why don't we take a couple of questions? Yes. Not individually. So, well, did they collectively? Start, did they collectively start financing themselves? They did. They bought. They bought castles and estates, and they what they really loved to spend their extra money on. By the with permission of the Pope, by the way, this came with papal permission. Was priories. Priories are like monasteries. Okay, that's what they really wanted to invest in so that they could have different degrees within the Templar order. So that you had novices, you had you know, uh, midway initiates, you had more advanced and so forth. And then also to be able to provide some kind of a pension for those who were injured and maimed for life or for those who just couldn't do it anymore on the battlefield and needed to retire. Yeah. And in a way, you might say that what, 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 what Philip the fourth does is almost like a form of a military suicide, you know, that you call home your most elite order of troops and then start picking them off with ridiculous wild accusations because what you really want is their treasury. Um, I think the papacy would probably have allowed the Templars to serve the French monarchy if the French monarchy had been a little more loyal to the papacy. And, and it's not the entire French monarchy, by the way, that has gone astray. One branch of the French monarchy is thriving in southern Italy, and that is the House of Anjou, or we might say the House of Anjou slash Naples. Okay? They are a cadet line, a branch of the French monarchy that are invited by the Pope to southern Italy to govern southern Italy and to defend Italy from the Holy Roman Empire. And they will establish a dynasty in Naples that will last for over, well over 200 years. You haven't heard about that because we're duped by English history in America. And remember, the English are latecomers to medieval power. Latecomers. Everything important that happens in medieval Europe happens in the Mediterranean. It doesn't happen way up there. Okay. 1450, October 25th, 1450. Um, a, a generation later? Elizabeth. Exactly. And the canon shows up and changes the whole dynamic of medieval warfare. And along with the canon, muskets. Again, changing the whole dynamic. And some people saying, oh, those are the weapons of cowards. <laughs> the, the, the first, the, the last knights had that moral and, 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 and rational dilemma. What kind of weapons are these? These are the weapons of a coward. What, are you going to hide behind a tree and shoot me? <laughs> yep, sure am. Yep, because you're rich and you've got armor and I don't. You see? So, the, so a different kind of foot soldier becomes really important to medieval warfare. And these things that I'm telling you right now, there are people in the United States and all over the world that are reenactors of, of medievalism, of medieval warfare. The Renaissance Festival in Colorado is a great place where you see a lot of that in, on display. Um, medievalism is alive and well, and medieval militarism is alive and well. There are lots of companies making lots of money from selling armor and from selling swords and from selling costumes. <laughs> Uh, yes, you had your hand up and then we'll get to you. Yes. That was going to be, my question actually was, uh, you mentioned earlier that neo-Nazi groups that they reference the Templars. Why are they doing that? Are they enamored with the romanticism of that period? Do they consider themselves to be the Templars of today? Some of them do. I've spoken to some of these young men and some of them do. Um, the Templars passed into German mythology in the great 
German legend of Parsifal. Parsifal was one of the Grail Knights. There's no King Arthur in these stories because these are not English stories. These are German stories. Um, and uh, there is a, a reference in some of that literature, literature <coughs> to the Templiazin who guard the Grail. Um, and of course, what is the Grail? Well, the Chalice of the Last Supper. In guarding the Grail, you're guarding the church, you're guarding God. Um, so that's how German mythology and German popular culture ends up falling in love with these knights. There's also the Teutonic Knights of medieval German legend, of medieval German lore. Um, not quite the Templars, but also, you know, very romanticized warriors. Far more ruthless than the Templars, because they had not taken some of the vows that the Templars had taken. So there is this fascination in Germany and in Austria and in some parts of France and northern Italy. Again, all of those areas that were part of the former Holy Roman Empire. There is this fascination with that. And then when Germany is being formed in the, eight, in the late 1700s and, and early 1800s as a modern nation state, <coughs> there is a way of looking back to the glories of the Templars, to the glories of the, of the Teutonic Knights, and trying to, to translate some of that into the Prussian army and the Prussian cavalry of the late 1700s and early 1800s, who of course fought valiantly against Napoleon. Do, do you see? So, and maybe in the conflict with Napoleon and Germany, you see some of the old the old feuds from 200, 500 years earlier. Um, and then unfortunately, and I don't know how much of this we're going to get to tonight, but we will cover it in detail next week. Unfortunately, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, so-called New Templar societies begin emerge, emerging in Germany and in Austria. And many of those talk about the superiority of the white race, um, Adolf Hitler is a member of one of those, so is uh, um, uh, Goebbels, so is Eichmann. Um, in fact, the SS begins as the ONT. The ONT literally meant Ordo Novis Templis. So in many ways, the SS was already a white supremacist Nazi reinvention of what the Templars were but along the lines of German nationalism and German racialization, okay? Hitler's favorite story was the story of Parsifal, but the Wagnerian version, you know, Wagner, the opera composer, Wagner's version, which has no Jews and no Muslims in it and no Arabs in it, okay? The original medieval stories had Jews and Muslims and Arabs portrayed in very honorable ways under the code of feudalism under chivalry. And because, you know, by then many people were saying, what do you suppose it means that there's more than one religion? And don't you Jews and Muslims agree with us on certain things that are also in Christianity? And some of the knights who fought in the Crusades brought those ideas back with them. But it wasn't just the knights who fought in the Crusades. All of the crusading forces had clergy to minister to their religious needs and even some of the clergy were transformed by their dialogues with rabbis and imams in the, in the crusading territories. Francis of Assisi is perhaps the most famous example of this. Uh, I don't want to pour it on too much. Uh, if I have a chance tonight, if not for sure next week, I'll talk about that story, which is really a form of medievalism because it still gets told and retold and retold today as an inspiration for religious tolerance uh, between Christians and Muslims, okay? So yeah, Francis of Assisi went on crusade. His boss hoped he would never come back from the crusade. Seriously, because he was a troublemaker. I'm very serious. I think they sent him intentionally. <laughs> they sent him to one of the worst of the crusades. Um, let me see what else I have here for you. Did, was there another hand up? I want to take a break in eight minutes. <coughs> oh, yes. Where the divine right of the 
king mm -hmm. and the divinity of Christ <coughs> were, were being uh, hammered out. And what, maybe you could unpack a little bit of that. Yeah, unfortunately, yep, yep, great, great that question. Was over treasury or something. Yeah, unfortunately, it's all about land. Um, it's also about power. Um, in the early Middle Ages, remember the church, we're lucky the church didn't get wiped out by feudalism, okay? The Vikings are a perfect example of having no respect for church property or for clergy, nuns, priests, uh, you know, they were all worthy of... Um, in that context <coughs> of all of that feudal militarism, the church tried to pacify the warlords and the barbarians in part by converting them to Christianity. And the church had a policy of converting the noble families, the warlords, the chieftains, and their families, in the hope that by converting them, the rest of the tribe would follow. That didn't happen, okay? The rest of the tribes continued worshiping their old gods and goddesses. But for the royal families, for these noble families, this idea of the divine right of kings, which had existed in the Roman Empire and existed in Byzantium, in the Byzantine Empire, this idea appealed greatly to them. And probably it even, it's even further cemented by that act of coronation on Charlemagne. This idea that if you agree to abide by the teachings and the rules and the traditions of the Christian church, God will favor you and the church will favor you and your descendants as these warlords, as these chieftains, as these kings. Um, and so the struggle between the church and state, you might say it's the state trying to reassert its authority over the church and saying, oh no, you don't have the right to tell me that I can't fight. You don't have the right to tell me that my daughter can't marry so-and-so. You don't have the right to tell me that I can't divorce this woman who can't give me a son. Because without a son, my kingdom and my heirs are doomed. <laughs> it's really, I mean, you know, it's really pernicious personal stuff. Um, and, it's, and it's very much about land. Very much about land. The land that we have been entrusted by the king and the land that is ultimately the king's. And then how are we going to transfer to our heirs and to our descendants, if at all? If at all. So it's really, yeah, does that get it at some of your questions? Yeah. You know, and again, you know, to, to be honest with you, my sympathies are with the church. And not because I'm a Christian. I mean, you know, without the church, civilization, the lights really go out in civilization. Without the church, the books aren't preserved. Without the church, the engineering knowledge isn't preserved. <laughs> Without the church, the warlords just keep burning each other's fields and poisoning each other's water and killing each other. <laughs> and yet the church also got co-opted. And that's why we needed all those reformations and all those revolutions later on. Because the church itself allowed itself to be co-opted in ways that I really don't think Jesus could have imagined. Prince of peace. The Prince of Peace, the King of Kings. And in ways that I don't think God intended for this, this nightmare. <laughs> you know, God did not intend for the nightmare of the Black Death, and God sure as heck did not intend for the nightmare of feudal warfare. You know, because one of the big phrases in the Middle Ages is, everything happens as God wills it. I'm like, really? You know? Maybe that's not a God that I want to do business with. You know? Uh, <laughs> I'm reminded of the, of the, of the king, uh, of one of the, ch one of the uh, chiefs in the colonial experience when the Spaniards asked him if he would convert. After experiencing Spanish br brutality, he said, and if I convert, will I go to heaven? And the Spanish commander said, yes, of course. Uh, and is heaven filled with people like you? And the, the Spanish commander said, I hope so. And the, the native chief said, well, then forget about it. I, I don't want to convert. <laughs> I don't repent and I don't want to convert. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Um, you were saying that the, the church was, you know, in, in a sense kind of weak and struggling during this medieval time. 
Yes. But at the same time, they seem to really be wielding a lot of power. Yes. And stuff. So Through donations. It, yeah. So is it, is it one of these situations where, you know, they sort of come with a lot of bravado but not a whole lot of substance and they're just trying to match playing the chess pieces against your royal families and feudalism? Yeah. They lost control of the game. They're trying very, very hard to maintain a semblance of morality and of virtue uh, and of balance, but they end up getting co-opted, you know? I mean, if, if you leave an entire estate to the church in your will, or what often happened is that a widow might give all of her wealth to the church um, if she had no other heirs, um, and then become a nun herself, or a man late in life uh, after his wife had died or maybe multiple wives had died, would give over a significant portion, if not all of his wealth, assuming he had no heirs, to the church and become a priest or a monk. Um, but imagine after several hundred years of that kind of donation, uh, not always at the end of life, sometimes while people were alive, just, again, as philanthropy, as altruism. I mean, really, by, 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 by the time of the Reformation, the church is unbelievably wealthy, unbelievably powerful. And in a world where, where wealth and power was based upon land, upon how much land you controlled, wow. And then there were bishops and archbishops and cardinals that didn't, ha didn't feel any sense of a conflict of interest being in their positions and giving the nicest contracts to their own, their own extended feudal family, okay? Uh, like, for example, uh, imagine in the construction of some of the Gothic cathedrals where bishops and archbishops would say, oh, my family has a quarry not far from here, and we will negotiate these terms with you. I mean, that's like absurd, right? Because the cathedral is the bishop's chair, that's literally what cathedra means, chair of the bishop. And so you can imagine the unbelievable conflicts of interest in the economic realm that would emerge. Um, and then we might even be able to help us understand why sometimes the populace, the people, would riot in anger and revolt, and in some instances literally pull the bishop or an archbishop out of their bed in the middle of the night and beat them to death. Okay, During times of drought and famine, and, and significant suffering inflicted upon the people through the tax system. Um, I, I mean, we could go on and on and on with stories of this. Um, so yeah, does that give you an idea? Yeah. And again, I don't wanna, I don't wanna overly demonize the medieval world either because we've done too much of that for the last 400 years. Medievalism also means ignorant, backward, superstitious, stupid. It also means that. Um, and, and I don't think that's fair to the past either because I don't like to ostracize the past or scapegoat the past. But we could easily do that because our own culture has done that for the last 400 years or so. I didn't say that at the beginning of the course. Medievalism also means ignorant, backward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes? Mm -hmm. If you were a cleric and you were a member of the clergy and you were accused of something, you had the right to go to the court of the church and you weren't subject to the rule of the king any longer. Exactly. And so, I mean, there, there were benefits, you know, and even like this whole thing of families doing this. I mean, I understand how bad timing was and how it got out of control. But what I find funny is, is that even in the 21st century, right, like in, even within our own denomination, we have preferred vendors. Mm -hmm. Right? We have preferred vendors for our pensions, for our buildings, for yep. our maintenance contracts, and all of that stuff. And yep. even within the church itself, how many of you have met a pastor in your life who told you that their dad and their granddad and their great granddad were all Methodist ministers? <laughs> right? You know what I mean? So, I, yep. mean, it, it, I think, I mean, for me, I, I guess the point of my question is you have to be careful with this, right? Because these practices of signing and stuff, I mean, what was really going on? I mean, does it make 
sense for feudal families to perpetuate the clergy yeah. within the church, especially if it's done correctly? And does it go awry when it's just a quest for land and power and money? And, and that's what Luther is upset about, right? Right. I mean, yep. The selling of indulgences yeah. or even the, the lending of money uh, for interest, which the church opposed. The church opposed. Um, and even in indulgence, right? I mean, like yep. a lot of people that are Catholic don't even understand what an indulgence is. I mean, the church still does that. And yes. It's bad rap because nobody really knows. <laughs> I mean, an indulgence is not a bad thing. Right? No, it is Today not. Today is All Souls Day. Yes. Oh, that's right. So, I mean, Today is All Souls Day. Day. That's right. right? Yep. And an indulgence still comes with penance. Yes. It's not just a get out of jail free card. You still have to pay a penance. Yes. And you know, there is something of the indulgence that has survived in in the last 50 to 70 years. Uh, My family was Catholic. I'm not, but my family, most of my family still is. Traveling to Rome and requesting a special papal certificate for anywhere from $25 to $50, which you can then take home and put over the doorway of your home, on the inside, of course, as a, as a papal blessing, but also as a, as a form of forgiveness. Um, not quite the same as a, as a medieval or Reformation indulgence, but a, analogous almost, right? Yeah, so yeah, I think you raise some very good questions. Maybe some of these patterns, some of these practices, some of these traditions are still with us across different denominations, and some of it isn't all bad. When I tell you that civilization in Europe might have, uh, might have vanished were it not for the Christian church, I absolutely mean that. Seriously. Okay? I absolutely mean that. Uh, yes? Everybody knows that Henry VIII uh, did down with the Catholic Church. Did it happen? Um, I didn't, I'm sorry, the beginning of your question again? How, it, it was me, it wasn't how you. How did the other countries resolve their dependence on the church? Good question. Well, France did not until the French Revolution. Right. Spain did not until the 1840s or 1850s. In fact, yeah, it's England that begins to distance itself and Germany uh, because of the, the Lutheran Reformation. But Spain and France do not. And Italy is, is the puppet of Spain or France or the Holy Roman Empire. Until, Italy doesn't even exist until the, 18, the late 1830s. Um, so in much of Europe, the reason why the democratic revolution goes in a secular direction is because the, the, dem, the democratic theorists all believe that the medieval church had to be separated from all forms of government. The medieval world would think you and I are crazy to live under the separation of church and state. And yet we think it's one of our greatest accomplishments over the last four to 500 years. And we're still struggling with it because some people get very nervous when democratic leaders start claiming um, certain religious precepts. Do you remember Bill Clinton? Uh, and his 1992 Democratic Convention speech, the New Covenant speech, mm-hmm. clergy all over the United States, regardless of what denomination they were in, were bothered by that. How dare he use that metaphor to describe his political agenda? Okay. <laughs> um, we could think of other examples of this. So if we really believe in the separation of church and state as as an inviolable principle of modern democratic egalitarian government, then we should all be very leery of when our religious leaders uh, use religious tropes for certain reasons, for certain purposes. It's one thing to talk about your personal piety. It's another thing to try and clothe your agenda in religious terms. Um, Because ultimately those are agendas of this world. Uh, And we don't even know where God would stand on some of those agendas, or Jesus for that matter. So these are difficult things to talk about. 
because modern society has been so programmed to think about God and country, you know, patriotism and piety. But I'm not sure that's what Jesus wanted us to do. You need to be very careful with that because the state may ask you to do things that neither God nor Jesus nor the Holy Spirit would ever ask you to do. And yes, I know that we think the oh, medieval church, bad, 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 bad. But uh, the state, the state can, can be equally dehumanizing and perhaps even far more dehumanizing than a religious organization. Look at Germany. <laughs> you know, the Lutheran church was the German church. And it still didn't stop them from the rise of Nazism. You know, if anything, Hitler walks around quoting Luther all the time, even saying that the Nazi movement is a way of fulfilling the Protestant Reformation, the Lutheran Reformation. And as Martin Niemöller, the great German theologian of the 20th century, said, you know, when they said this, I didn't stand up. When they said this, I didn't stand up. When they said this, now they're coming for me and I have no one else left to stand up for me because eventually the Nazis turned on the Lutheran church. <laughs> and patriotism didn't save the, the Lutheran church. Patriotism and assimilation didn't save German Jews. They thought that by being Germanized and assimilated, they might be saved from the camps. And it didn't save them. So, I guess, you know, the ultimate question is, where is your allegiance? Is it first to the Lord, your Savior, and God and the Holy Spirit, and all those beautiful principles that are in the scriptures, the ones that haven't been co-opted, you know, the stuff in there that is still meaningful thousands of years after it was first thought or, or written or, or said, or is your allegiance to the country, to the nation state, to the national identity, you know, I don't know, that doesn't sound very American. What the heck is an American? You know, maybe that's one of the great struggles that we're fighting right now to redefine what it means to be an American. And that's not a religious question. That's not a theological question. But for some people it is. And who knows, maybe it shouldn't be. <laughs> I mean, I don't have all the answers. Don't think I'm up here getting too prophetic or too preachy with you. It's just that, remember, I'm Cuban-American. And my family lost their country because of a revolution that promised to succeed where religion failed, okay? And quite frankly, what the communists delivered was far worse than what existed before them, even if they taught people to read and write in ways that, that Cuba didn't have literacy before. My parents lost everything, and it destroyed my family. I had people in my family who were capitalists, democratic capitalists, and I had people in my family who were hardline communists, who believed that communism would save Cuba and transform Cuban society. And it didn't. It delivered some things that were far worse than what existed before, far more brutal, far more dehumanizing than what existed before. So, and since we were all, all of us in this room were born in the 20th century, that struggle between communism and capitalism or between totalitarianism and, and democratic values was one of the great struggles of the century in which we were born. And that has nothing to do with medievalism. <laughs> or maybe it does in an indirect way. Uh, why don't we take a break, please? I have 742 on my, on my end. Can we, can we reconvene in 10 minutes? Sure. Okay. Thank you. All right, why don't we go ahead and reconvene, please? Let's, let's uh, get started again. And we can also have some Q&A about 8.15 in about 20 minutes. So if you'll just bear with me for a little bit, and then I'll open it up again for, for question and answer period. Okay? So this is one of the scenes from Kingdom of Heaven. This is Jeremy Irons playing the role of Tiberius, um, Lord Commander of the Knights of Jerusalem. And again, you see the moniker of the Knights of Jerusalem. 
the uh, yeah the yeah the uh, I think it's referred to as a Byzantine cross. Oh yes, thank you very much. Yes, 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 yes. It is a Jerusalem cross. Yes, yes. Does anyone know what the four crosses represent? The four crosses, the little four crosses in each corner of the square represent, a cross is really a square, okay? What does it represent? It represents the, the different districts of a medieval city where you have the Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Christian quarter, and in the Muslim case, the, the, the quarter of the Dimma. The Dimma were the people who were neither Jewish nor Christian nor Muslim. And under Islamic law, they were protected fully protected by the laws as long as they paid their taxes. A lot of people preferred to be conquered by the Muslims than by the Christians, by the way. And that is not, again, me demonizing Christianity. It's actually in the historical record. And so, just for a little, a little fun, here am I. <laughs> My uh, chain mail slipped a little bit. Um, this was this weekend. I was at Comic Con. Uh, my daughter Sarah is a novelist, and she has a very uh, well received series out. It's a trilogy about angels, Michael versus Lucifer versus Satan. Um, and I said, Hey, do you want me to show up in costume? She said, Sure, come on down. Um, <coughs> I've used this costume a lot over the years. I look a little skinnier than Jeremy Irons because I'm not wearing the armor underneath it. Jeremy Irons is really, is really f pumped up and fluffed up because of the, uh, the, the, the chain mail that he's wearing and the armor that he's wearing. Anyway, again, just a little fun. No, I'm not a fanatic, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I do have my own toys. Um, and again, it would look fuller if I had a breastplate on. Um, oh, they, uh, I couldn't, br I, yeah, yeah, I couldn't show up with any of my real swords. I probably would have been arrested. Um, th those, uh, well, the gloves, I, I misplaced my actual medieval gloves that are, that are, that are, that are, that are, are weathered and brown. Um, but no, the sword is a foam sword. And I don't know if you can see this, uh, purple, uh, ribbon, oh, yeah. there was a, a, a prop check at the entrance to the convention center and anyone who walked in with anything made of wood or metal, it, it was held, uh, it was taken away from them basically. So only, only plastic swords and foam swords were allowed. Anyway, enough of me. So let me, let me turn the subject to, <coughs> I don't know how many of you remember or if you've ever seen Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? Oh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, I've been talking nonstop since last Wednesday, seriously. Um, I think I mentioned last week at the end of, the, at the end of our session together that the Nazis had a, an elite unit of SS officers that were also archaeologists and scholars, and they really believed that if they could find the grail or other religious objects, that it would just add to the mystique of the Nazi movement. Remember, Führer already means literally vessel. And when Hitler says, I am the vessel of the German spirit, he was intentionally alluding to these mythologies of sacred vessels. Not just the chalice of the Last Supper, but the chalice of the great dragon slayer of German mythology, Siegfried, who slays the dragon, drinks the dragon's blood, and becomes the song of nature himself. As the, as the mythology says. What does it mean to become the song of nature? I guess it says something about spirituality and divinity and transformation. Um, and, and again, this, was, this is not just a Nazi thing. Lots of people in Germany in the 1800s and 1900s were fascinated by the legends of the grail, the stories of the grail, the iconography of the grail, the symbolism of the grail, and one of the legends, one of the stories <coughs> that Indiana Jones, that finds its way into Indiana Jones is this idea that there were three knights, three knights who 
went on crusade and through a series of adventures find the grail. This is one of those knights who by the time Indiana Jones runs into him has been alive for over 700 years because the legend says that the, the chalice of the Last Supper is also the cup of immortality. Um, and of course, you see, you see the table there in the foreground, or rather in the background, and it's filled with chalices. <laughs> and uh, Sir Richard, I believe is the character's name, says to Indy, choose wisely, because Indy has to find the right grail. And of course, Indy's saying in his head, I think because he had learned it from his father in his father's grail diary, what kind of a chalice would a, a humble carpenter use at the Last Supper? Big question, right? So uh, I, 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 it doesn't, I mean, the movie came out in 1989, so it's not like a spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of the Nazi wackos shows up and like shoves Indy out of the way and says, I let me try, let me try. I will do it. I'll find it. And of course, he chooses one of the most elaborate and decorated and, 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 and lavish cups and he drinks and he turns into a monster and blows up into a thousand pieces. Um, and again, Sir Richard says, choose wisely. <laughs> um, so you can imagine... You, you can imagine. <laughs> um, and of course, Indy chooses the least, the least fancy of those cups. I think it was made of wood, the one that he chooses. Okay? Um, and uh, he is transformed. Um, yeah. So, so notice again, the thing about the Grail legends is they're all about chivalry. They're all about the relationship of Christ to the human person and the relationship of Christ to the political community, okay? The Grail legends are very much tied to that idea of king by divine right, but king also because you match the virtues of Christ. Not a king who takes and takes and takes and takes and takes, but a king who is a, a, a servant leader, a, a steward of God's kingdom on earth that's built into all the Grail legends, and the Grail legends, the Christian Grail legends, go back to the 900s. And I believe that they go back even further to pre-Christian times, maybe even three or 4,000 years ago, uh, when the Celts uh, celebrated the traditions and the festivals of Bronn and Bronn's Cauldron. Okay? So you get the picture there. Um... Yeah, I could go on and on talking about this. I'm being mindful of our time. Let me give you one example of the way some of these grail legends play out. I love the humor in, in the stories. My dissertation was on one of the grail legends. I focused on a grail legend written around the year 1200 in, in uh, medieval Europe by a German poet knight who had also been a crusader. And the legend is called Parsival which also happens to be the story that 700 plus years, about 700 years later would become Adolf Hitler's favorite story. Yep, believe it or not. Except remember, Hitler made sure that his story had no Jews, no Muslims, no black people, no Arabs in it. Um, my, the story that I worked is filled with Jews and Muslims and Arabs and black people. And, and part of the message of my story that I worked with is the reconciliation of the children of Abraham, okay? Through the magic of the grail and through idea of the idea of the Abrahamic family. I don't have time to get into it all, but let me just tell you that I love the humor in many of these stories because in many of the, and again, there's dozens upon dozens of different versions of the, of the quest for the holy grail. And the grail is not always holy. Sometimes it's just the grail. Grail means chalice. Or, 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 or sacred dish, or sacred cauldron, or sacred bowl. <coughs> I love the moment in many of those stories when the knight is like weary, you know, his, he, he hasn't had a bath, he hasn't had a meal, he's been searching for the grail in some cases for seven years, and he is at his wit's end. He's emaciated, 
he, can't, he, he doesn't even know how he would fight an attacker if an attacker came upon him. <clears throat> and he's riding through the countryside still. And he says, you there, have you heard about that thing they call the grail? Do you know where it is? And usually it's a simple farmer, male or female, tilling the land and says, oh, you again. Yeah, yeah, I told you, it's down the road over the bridge and you turn left. Gosh. And the night is like, <laughs> how could this be? How could the chalice of the Last Supper be something so simple? And one day, when he least expects it, regardless of the night, whether it's Percival or Parseval or not the same name, you know, Gawain, whoever, Lancelot, whoever, one day when he least expects it, usually around Easter or Pentecost. In fact, Pentecost is more common in the Grail literature. He gallops or rides down the road. He goes over a bridge and he turns left. And miraculously, he finds himself inside the Grail castle. And then he hears a voice, which he assumes is the voice of Christ. And the voice says, what is the secret of the grail? And the knight answers, second question. Oh, have you found what I lost? Have you found what I lost? And then the third question is a biblical one. Who am I? And that is the voice of Christ. And then, of course, the, a, a miraculous mystical hand brings the grail up to the knight's face. And right before the knight drinks from the chalice, the chalice of the Last Supper, the chalice of communion, the chalice of transformation, what do you think the knight would see reflected in the wine? Come on, you can do this. Maybe, but 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 on a on a on a on a, on a more simp on a simpler level, himself. exactly himself, and we don't know what else he sees, because he may see his face morph into the face of Christ, which then reminds him that Christ is inside of us. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. So it is a magical, a truly magical and mystical and transformative moment. In the Grail literature? And imagine something as simple as, oh yeah, everybody knows where that is. It's down the road over the bridge and you turn left. <laughs> you again. I mean, it's hilarious. But it also underscores the subtlety and the simplicity of opening our hearts and our minds. And what I love the most about the story is it always says turn left. And in the Middle Ages, that was actually not a good thing. What is the Latin word for left? Does anyone know? Sinister. Exactly. And it's almost as if the, the, the mythology and the stories and the legends are saying, you have to have the courage to follow your inner truth. You have to have the courage to trust the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Because don't forget, it almost always is around Pentecost Sunday when this happens, or Pentecost Saturday. Saturday of Pentecost weekend is really big in Grail literature. Think about that. It's almost as if our ancestors were already saying 700, 800 years ago, you have to have the courage to trust yourself, to trust the Holy Spirit, to trust, trust divine guidance, and maybe go against society. Go to the left. In a, in a world that believed that left was sinister because the damned are, are, are sent off to the left hand of God, to the left side of God, and the righteous are on the right side. And there are other ways that this plays out in medieval literature when Gawain or any of the other knights are going down the road together and one of the knights hears something or maybe a startled rabbit or a fox, and, he, and he, he, he pulls the reins on his horse, and he tells his companions, go on without me. I'm going through the dark wood. 
And by going through the dark wood, he finds the grail in the forest eventually in a place that no one knew or no one imagined it might have been. But again, the quest for the grail is the quest, is the quest for our inner self and our relationship with Christ. And I think that's why grail stories and grail legends and grail myths are still very, very popular in the 21st century as another form of medievalism, but one that appeals to our own sense of individuality and our own sense of agency and maybe our own sense of somehow being in relationship with Christ through the Holy Spirit, through communion. Um, and I know not all modern grail literature even uses a chalice. Certainly a lot of Hollywood movies in recent years have completely left that out. But I think that's part of the ongoing fascination for many Christians of the grail mythology and the grail stories. Okay, that really got your attention. You're all... You're all <laughs> uh, and one does not have to be a man to go on a grail quest. Okay. Have you ever heard of Teresa of Avila? Yeah. Famous Christian saint and mystic. Guess what her favorite pastime was in her spare time? This is true. This is true. Her favorite entertainment in her spare time was to read grail stories. Yes. And she identified more with the knights than with the damsels. One of her nicknames in her lifetime was the Wild Woman of Avila, okay? Uh, presumably because people found out about this passion of hers. But it shows you that in 1515, in, in the 15, she lived from 1515 to 1560 something, okay? It shows us that in the early and mid 1500s, Grail literature was extremely popular in Spain. Okay, and you remember Don Quixote, Cervantes' uh, fantastic novel about a knight who has lost his mind, and he battles what? He battles windmills because he thinks that the windmills are monsters or dragons. At the beginning of the story, Cervantes tells us that Don Quixote went crazy, went insane, lost his mind from reading too many stories of chivalry which I think shows us that the culture was starting to turn away from that kind of an obsession with this. This is an example of medieval popular culture and of early modern popular culture. The Grail literature is one of the best examples that I can give you of medieval popular culture and of early modern popular culture. It just so happens that it still survives in our time through modern day medievalism, okay? So, I don't know how much of this I want to cram in, but let me just show you the more disturbing parts of this. So, this is an image from the internet, from the dark web, as they say, from a white supremacist organization. Okay, Dus Vult is one of the phrases that shows up in Kingdom of Heaven. It literally means God willing, God's will. Dus Vult. Um, here is a, presumably a young man, I mean, who knows, it could be a woman in that costume, uh, standing in front of what? The World Trade Center. And an American flag, and of course, the definition that he gives us is not the definition of Dus Vult. The definition below says, mess with Christianity, and we'll hit you so hard your ancestors will feel it. This one was very popular in the years after 9-11. And it's still out there available on the web. Again, I don't think the Templars... Well, again, this is the use and misuse of history. Here, let me show you another one. Again, a Templar knight with the quintessential Templar cross. The devil whispers, you cannot withstand the storm. The warrior replies, I am the storm. Again, from the dark web. Originally from the dark web, now it's everywhere. 
And there's another one that I found. I mean, there's tons of these. You can look them up too if you want. Um, because of the website that these were pulled off of? Okay. Yeah, they're white supremacist, white nationalist, neo-Nazi organizations. Um, I mean, it sounds harmless, but it's a recruitment tool for, for young men. Um, and, and if you're a young man with an interest in medievalism, you know, either through Game of Thrones or through the, a Renaissance festival, maybe you have a costume like mine, um, you know, maybe you bought a sword. Um, maybe you are a member of the Society for Creative Anachronism, which reenacts all kinds of medieval ways of living and medieval military practices. Mm, you know, maybe this grabs your attention in a way that is not off-putting uh, with a more overt Nazi, you know, swastika flag and someone standing dressed in a Nazi outfit that looks like you came out of the 1930s. Um, and then here's another one. Again, notice they, they seem relatively harmless and they appeal to our patriotism. <clears throat> this is a quote from the Japanese admiral. I fear that all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve following Pearl Harbor. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it from George Santayana, a very famous quote from a very famous philosopher. And at the bottom, all I need to know about Islam. <laughs> I learned on 9-11-01, never forget, never forgive, enough said, America has an enemy, its name is radical Islam. I work on Islamophobia, I work on the history of medieval Islam, so these appeal to me and I've used them in different courses, but I am amazed how something like this, because of its appeal to patriotism, becomes an avenue into all sorts of other things. I also have friends who work for the FBI, uh, and they've told me that this is the kind of stuff that they're always looking for in terms of counterterrorism, because there are a lot of disgruntled young men out there for all sorts of reasons that American society has failed them, Okay, uh, sometimes we need to understand the suffering of the other if we are truly going to be serious about Christian compassion. Um, and, uh, you know, it could be any number of things. It could be the family has fallen on, on hard economic times. It could be that your father died in Gulf War I or Gulf War II or maybe even in the World Trade Center. Um, and some of those things become a doorway, an entryway to all sorts of other things. The, the age group tends to range from age 17 to early 30s, okay, among white supremacist neo-Nazi groups, white nationalist groups, and so forth. The anti-Semitic stuff I, I, I didn't bring because it's quite disturbing. Um, a lot of it is picking on Jews and picking on Muslims and, pe and picking on Americans of color, you know, blacks, Lat uh, Hispanics, Asian Americans. Um, these groups are really big in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, not sure what the appeal is there. Uh, but now in some ways they're in all, in all of the major cities. Um, I think they've taken a big hit <coughs> after the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. Uh, but many of those individuals, those types of individuals with those sympathies were represented among the people who stormed the Capitol on that day. Um, so medievalism is alive and well, and not, not, for, not always for good reasons. Not always for good reasons. If you ask me what is the tie, what is the connection between medievalism and white supremacy, some of it is just the, the, the romanticism and the mythology of Medieval knights, you know, the Templars especially, and also how the Templars were treated by the French monarchy. Many young men who have joined these groups say that the story of the betrayal of the Templars appealed to them because they feel that their country, their government, betrayed the white race. And this is true in the United States, as it is in France, as it is in Germany, as it is in Austria, as it is in Italy, 
as it is in South America, this is a, this is a phenomenon across the Western world. Okay? Um, and then the other appeal, I think, is simply the myth of European origins in the Middle Ages. That all of the great nations of Europe began as white nations in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, and they over time became contaminated and degenerated by intermarrying with non-whites. That's part of the discourse, that's part of what they say, that's part of what they're angry about. Um, and, and some of the groups uh, you look forward to the formation of a white nation somewhere in the United States. A lot of them were fantasizing about somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, which is not going to happen, right? Because we're not just going to have a huge chunk of Washington and Oregon and, you know, and just say, all right, you know what, this is your new homeland. We don't want anything to do with you. That's not going to happen. But yet they talk about that. And many of them also believe that there is a, a race war coming. Some of them believe we're already in the midst of that race war. Um, and think about this. If this, is what you, if this is what you think and breathe and read and talk about and go to sleep thinking about, uh, you end up pretty soon living in a, in a, in a different reality than, 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 than many, many of your fellow Americans. Um, so yeah, so we go from this, romantic medievalism. This is, by the way, as a German knight being knighted by a woman, which I've told you probably never happened. Anything like this ever happened, okay? And you can see she's idealized. She's like the perfect, the perfect maiden. Uh, we go from that to, to that. And there's others. I just, you know, it's just a question of how, how, how much of this disturbing stuff do I want to show people? Questions, thoughts, reflections. So, oh, I should end on a happier note. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, maybe, maybe it's a sobering moment. I have a layperson question. Yes. I want to know what conversation at your dinner table looks like within children. Oh, that is, that is hilarious. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, yeah, well, I'm single now, but when we get together, all of us, on holidays, yeah, we do, we do talk a lot about, uh, I mean, you know, three, three of the four kids are very much into history and mythology, and, and my youngest daughter is a novelist, um, yeah, I'd say that the conversations can get pretty interesting. I'd love to hear that. But I, also, but I also have to be honest with you, as a parent of four 20-something-year-olds, my oldest recently turned 30, they're very worried about the future, you know? Um, they're very worried about the future of the, of the United States of America. Um, I need to be mindful this is being recorded and they may not be happy about dad blurting blurting some of their concerns out, but, you know, all of them say that they're not interested in having children because they don't know where their country is headed. At least two or three of them have talked about moving to other countries if things in the United States get worse. Um, all of their friends talk about the same kinds of things. And, uh, and, 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 Children of friends and colleagues of mine say similar things about their uncertain future. And the thing that bothers them the most is the hate speech and the divisions that exist now in the United States. Not that they weren't there before, but they just feel that even among progressives, there is no common ground. Uh, even among conservatives, there doesn't seem to be common ground. And so for 20-something-year-olds, I think think they're very concerned about the country that they are inheriting from my generation and the generation of their grandparents. Well, I've got three of them in Texas and they're terrified. Thank you. And that's, that's not hyperbole. Thank you. That's a fact. Thank you. And I'm trying to soften it. They're, they're 27, 25, and 24. And yeah. They're, they're terrified. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My kids ask me, Dad, what country are you going to move to when this country falls apart? It's like, what? 
That's when I realized that they really were taking this stuff very seriously. Yes. You know, they think it's way harder than you think and all of us to immigrate to another country because we're immigrants from that country. My daughter was going to move to Ireland and you had to have a $50,000 job, you know, when you got Or in there. the bank. Yeah, I mean, you just can't say, okay, I'm moving to wherever. They, you know, you just can't do that. Yeah. But, they don't but because I'm first generation American and because their grandparents left everything behind, for my kids, it's not inconceivable because they saw their grandparents, they know that their grandparents arrived here with a wallet in, in a back pocket and only the clothes that they had on that day and they ended up, you know, rebuilding their lives. Of course, that's also the miracle of being of, of the United States, right? right? But you just can't move to another It's country. not that easy. Yeah, no, it's, she tried to do that. And yeah, no, it's not that easy. Yeah, but by the way, Ireland wants immigrants. Ireland still yeah. wants immigrants. I thought I'd live in New Zealand, but I discovered they won't let me in because they have such great benefits and they just don't want any old people to come in. Oh, wow. Interesting. You better uh, tell them to go now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I don't want them to leave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Which, you know, if we compare it to today, <coughs> is it just as bad? I, I, I would tend to think that it's not. Um, I'm not so sure about that. And then my second thing is kind of ties to what you were saying before the break. I don't know if you read the article today, but indigenous people in South America are now uh, taking lawsuits up against Christian evangelical missionaries because of they're, they're basically saying you were trying to colonize us illegally, you know, and harking back. And, there's, and at least the article I read today made references to the medieval times of that happening, you know, and up through the 1700s. And so they're now doing lawsuits. Like Brazil, there's indigenous people doing those lawsuits and stuff like that. So, I don't know. Any kind of so are American, uh, uh, so are Native American groups usually over water rights and land rights. And even though the United States uh, was an avowed enemy of Spain and vice versa in the colonial period and in the early Republic, believe it or not, the papal bull of 1494 is almost always cited by the U.S. courts and the U.S. government in defense of land rights and water rights for the government or for private corporations. And the papal bull of 1494 says that the European powers have the right of conquest over all inferior peoples. Oh, wow. And the Pope has not rescinded that bull. Even this Pope, who should know better. Think about what that means for power on this planet. And let me go one step further. Columbus's family lives today. They are up to Christopher Columbus the 24th. Yes. And every year, Columbus's family collects the equivalent of 100,000 American dollars in euros as the Spanish government continues to honor the treaty, no, excuse me, the contract that they had with Columbus in 1492. And that speaks volumes for the persistence of power over the indigenous peoples and it speaks volumes for the power of the colonial nations. Think about this, okay? Most Americans, Columbus, yeah. Pff. Well, Columbus's family is still collecting on that colonial enterprise. And uh, there have been numerous attempts, uh, assassination attempts on members of Columbus's family by native groups and also by Spanish separatists. Um, not that I'm advocating that, but you know, again, I specialize in the history of the Spanish Empire and in the history of Spanish colonialism, and I'm also a diver. I'm a native Floridian. I'm fascinated by the sea, and uh, every time that someone finds something at the bottom of the ocean, whether it's in international waters or territorial waters, 
Not, not long after it's found, the Spanish lawyers show up, staking a claim to the find. Even if it's been at the bottom of the ocean for what? 500 plus years? The most recent one is off the coast of either Maryland or Delaware, and it's in really, really deep water, and the Spanish government is holding it up in the world court and in U.S. courts because the, the recovery, the salvage, is expected to be around $900 million worth of gold. And I guess in the minds of the Spanish government, if they recover 10% of it, hey, it's worth it. But usually they recover more than 10%, which still baffles me, right? Because maritime international law says if something sinks to the bottom of the sea, after a certain number of years, it's finders keepers. And yet, the Spaniards still recover a portion of whatever is found down there. Think about what that says about the persistence of memory and the persistence of power and the persistence of that idea that some people are worthy of being conquered and enslaved. Because in a way, that's, what, that's what's behind that. You know, you're not Christian, you're not monotheistic, you're savages, that's the old ac accusation. Or we're just better than you. You know, it's, it's amazing how alive and well that is in 2021. I got my hands a few years ago on case studies from the University of Miami Law School, and the case studies are about how to handle a case of a salvage operation being challenged in court by the Spanish government or by another colonial power. The Dutch do this too. <laughs> it's not just the Spaniards. The English, I think rarely. I'd have to really go looking hard to find England meddling with this. Um, but think about that. <laughs> you're a young, brand new attorney, and you have one of these cases come to you, and you're like, wow. <laughs> you know, wow. So anyway. All right. Uh, one, one more. Uh, I want to honor our time. Go ahead. Yeah, no, there are, there are plenty. They, come yeah. they, they come from the Mediterranean. They come from Sicily. They come from Spain. Um, they come from southern France. They come from southern Italy. There are Muslim colonies on Italian soil in the Middle Ages that Italian um, feudal lords allowed to exist because there was economic benefit to the Italian feudal system from trading with Muslim and Arab uh, uh, businessmen. So there are plenty of people of color in Europe in the Middle Ages, uh, and they're not slaves. Some of them are very powerful and very successful and very influential. What happens in the 1600s, well, let's say it starts with 1492, uh, and then it just unravels from there in the 1500s and 1600s. It's the age of colonialism, the age of sl the slave trade, uh, the age of racialization. You know, modern Europe invents racial theories seriously in the 1600s. And this idea that if you have dark skin, you are somehow an inferior human being and that maybe God has put you in these black bodies because of some kind of evil, some kind of damnation. Uh, outrageous stuff. When you start reading this stuff, it's really outrageous. But in the um, Abbasid Empire, it, it existed until the 14th century. The what? Yes. It, it existed yes. in like the 8th or the 4th century. Yes. Like the 14th century. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, you would have to think that a, a, an empire like that was all over the place. Exactly. There is, there, there, there is a, a Muslim caliphate on European soil until January 2nd of 1492. And most of the inhabitants are, are darker than dark. <laughs> okay. They are Moroccans. They are Africans. They are Arabs, Muslims, Egyptians, Berbers. Yes, yes. And even after that, Spanish society is still very mixed. Okay? We don't have time to get into it, but one of the reasons that the English and the French and the Germans later on and the Dutch are so critical of Spain is because the Spanish population is so racially mixed. Um, 
And, and uh, yeah, it's really amazing when you start reading some of these modern history books from the 1700s and the 1800s, criticizing the Spaniards for being biracial or multiracial, which really was just, just a way of trying to marginalize Spain because Spain had been so incredibly powerful for so many hundreds of years. But notice that, that Spain, in Spain you could find all of the colors of the rainbow uh, well into the modern period and well throughout, uh, throughout the colonial period. It's just that white Spaniards figured out a way to distance themselves from the rest of the, of the population. When I travel, this is kind of an ugly thing to say, but when I travel in Spanish-speaking countries, someone always says something outrageous and absurd to me. Like, wow, look at your profile. You have the profile of a nobleman. And I'm like, come on, cut it out. Or the worst thing that I've been told, you must be so proud of your ancestors for not intermarrying with the Indians and the slaves. I've been told that multiple times, even in southern Colorado and northern New Mexico, where there are a lot of people who are descendants still of conquistadors. So imagine uh, the persistence of these things uh, still in our time. I want to go ahead. And they think it's a compliment. Yeah, and I have brown people in my family, by the way. So when they tell me that stuff, I'm like, well, I'm glad you haven't seen my sister then. You'd probably throw her out of town. <laughs> it's, it's really incredible. But again, it's the internal. And, and by the way, these people are usually not. I'm not talking about Americans telling me these things. I'm talking about people who are descendants of either Spanish settlers, okay, or people who are, de who are themselves mulatto or mixed race in Latin America. And there's a certain jealousy, a certain self-loathing when they tell you stuff like that. Like, wow, look how white you are. Um, and they are dark-skinned. And they know that doors of opportunity will open to me because of my white European features that will never open to them in Mexico, in Santo Domingo, in, you know, Colombia, in Peru, in Chile. It's incredible. And that's when you realize these very, very powerful legacies of colonialism that in some ways maybe are examples of medievalism. <laughs> you know, if colonialism is hyper-feudalism, as I told you, well then medievalism is alive and well in a lot of our racialized theories. You know, and we have the Spanish and the Dutch to thank for modern racism. Seriously. They formulated the theories and then other countries used them. I really need to honor a time. It's 7 after, it's 8.37. Uh, we will pick up there next week, um, and I want to talk a lot more next week about the Da Vinci Code as, as m my favorite example of medievalism, okay? Kent, we don't have time to watch the movie, but we can talk about the book. <laughs>